you have to be really intentional about, about putting a team together. Crawl out of the pile and just started screaming. How good is Joey Bosa? Herbert, rolling, looking, throwing, end zone, touchdown, it's intercepted. Derwin James. Derwin was there. You got to be on a mission every day in the NFL. But even more than that, you got to be on a mission together. Great hands, Keenan Allen. The Los Angeles Chargers select Rashawn Slater, Asante Samuel Jr. That was stop. Oh, I'm strapping y'all boys. I can't get it. Intercepted. Picked off by Michael Davis. Explosion. Explosiveness from Eckler. There's Murphy. Boy, he blew that up, didn't he? It is picked off. Nasir Adderley. 50-50 ball is 100%. Mike Williams. Otena Uwosu. And that will end it. Time to bolt up. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, is being brought to you by UFC Fit and Temecula, Brewery X in Anaheim, and Charger Bolt family. Dan Wolkenstein, I have a confession to make. Ooh. Honestly, I, I have to be honest with you. I have to be honest with our listeners. Most importantly, I had to be honest with myself. After 20 years of watching this Chargers team. I have come to the realization, I have admitted to myself, that I, Jake Hefner, need to invest in a pacemaker. (laughs) I can't handle this shit anymore. I can't do it. I have been through the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, and I have seen one too many games like this in the past where it does not end up going the Chargers' way. But I'll tell you what. Yeah, I I just can't handle that. I, I don't know how many Charger fans out there agree with me. I know I've talked about... We've always talked about the hypothetical heart attacks that Chargers fans get on a weekly basis during the football season, but my blood pressure has been up for for years, and I'm sure that it has a little bit to do with watching Chargers football for a long period of time. Most people would say, ah, you know, you got to get rid of your red meat and your, you know, your saturated fats. No, bullshit. (laughs) This is the reason. (laughs) This is the reason. So. I need to start watching my heart rate and I am committing to my health and I need to get a pacemaker because what the hell just happened in this game between the Chargers and the Cleveland Browns. Jake, welcome to Chargers Unleashed. Jake, it is so good to talk to you today. I have tons of feelings and things to get off of my chest, but before we get into any of that, Thank you to everyone who is tuning in for the first time, second time, or the umpteenth time. Grateful to have you. If you have not already, take two seconds, give us a quick like, follow, subscribe on YouTube as well as anywhere you find your podcasts. We have a ton, a ton to get into today. We're going to get all into the Chargers' miraculous game of the year victory against the Cleveland Browns. Obviously, we're going to get into some of the Good, bad, and the ugly. And I'm sure Jay's going to love talk about the ugly, but I'm going to break him down to earth real quick. When I sit down to earth, I mean up to earth because he's been living in the basement and I'm bringing him up to heaven. And you've and been living that, way up in Rainbow Land. Yeah, we're, we're in Rainbow Land right now. And then after that, of course, we get into Game Balls. And then as we go throughout the episode, Jake, we have literally a week's worth of Chargers Unleashed hotline voicemails to get through. It was a busy so, day. Busy day. It was a busy day. And so as we go through the show, be prepared for some entertainment as we continue to recap this game and all the voices we have. So Jake. Ooh, I don't even know where to start with you. <laughs> what? For for folks what? for fo- for folks who have who are new and you probably even could have guessed this if you haven't seen the show before. I am generally the optimist. Generally. Jake Jake is always the pessimist. That's true. <laughs> and there's this running joke, it's also reality, that as well as the Chargers go, 
during a game, the fewer, close to zero, actually literally zero, text messages I get from Jake Hefner. The worse the game is going, you can skyrocket that text message, that text chain to a thousand. Let's just say my text was blowing up on Sunday while I was sitting inside SoFi Stadium watching what transpired. And and I'm not going to call anybody out, but I'm looking at you, Chargers fans, Chargers Twitter, who is just, and I, I understand you're in your feelings. We've been burnt so many times. The Chargers have been cursed. Marlon McCree, Nate Kading, like, I get it. I've lived that life with you. But can we please show a little positivity and hope until the game's over? Like some of the vitriol and the vile and the negativity that was coming out of Chargers Twitter when the Chargers were down after one half of football. This is a different team. Have hope. We got Brandon Staley and we've got the God himself, it appears, in Justin Herbert. There is no deficit that is too big for this team, evident by what has happened two out of the last three weeks. So, Chargers fans, Jake, say it with me. This team, repeat after me, this team, this team is different. Is different? Not a question mark, period. <laughs> you can put it <laughs> this team is different. I know we've been burned, but evident five games in, still a long way to go. The past is the past. Time to sack up and enjoy what we have here. This is the most hype we have seen around this Chargers team, and for damn good reason to you, Jake. Chargers come from behind, beat the Cleveland Browns 47-42. So many storylines to get into about this game. Before we get into the good, bad, and the ugly, Overall, Jake, what is the last time the Chargers have been number one in the AFC, number one in the AFC West, and lead the Kansas City Chiefs by two games in their division? Technically, it could be two and a half, considering we have a tiebreaker. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. I can't when remember the, the la- exact same year, and I don't will not attempt to <laughs> to to know. But it's, you probably have to go to, I mean, the easy barometer is 2006. Mm-hmm. But if you really want to get specific about it, I, I don't know, Dan. But that's probably the one year that jumps out to me as far as how long it's been. So, yeah, it's been a hot minute. Jake, so th- this game, let's just kind of get into an overall recap of this game. First half went about as bad as you could hope for. and or as you could, you could brace for. Jake's predictions about, and honestly, my worries about the running game of this Cleveland Browns team came to fruition, and they absolutely beat us up all day long. Not just the first half, the entire, the entire game. Didn't stop. So Chargers fumble right before halftime, give up a field goal, go down 17-6 to six at halftime. Cleveland gets the ball, and then within, what, two minutes, they get like a 50-yard run. And all of a sudden, Chargers are like, oh, that's literally the worst that could happen. At that moment, Jake, describe to me and the listeners how you were feeling. Uh, Based off of what the defense had given up in the run game, I felt vindicated in my prediction that the game was going as I expected it to go. Now, I didn't expect it to be down like that. And I texted you, Dan, and I did say that after the fumble by Austin Eckler at the end of the second half, I said, you cannot afford to give them another score to start the third quarter. And I have to learn to just shut my mouth because (laughs) I know that a lot of things like to follow my pessimism. And sure enough, it's like the devil's fart followed my voice right into the Chargers game and went. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Opening drive, third quarter, 52-yard rush, and all of a sudden, 
<laughs> it's just it's starting to to look like a blowout. It's starting to look like out of, out of reach that the Chargers are not going to be able to overcome this. And then in some weird form fashion, because the Chargers, amongst everything that, of course, ended up leading up to the fourth quarter, the Chargers were able to get eight points to the Browns' seven. So it was very even as it related to the third quarter. It was pretty much a wash. And then the fourth quarter starts to go. Bananas. Basically, everything but the kitchen sink was thrown in the fourth quarter. I mean. 41 combined total points from both teams, 26 alone from the Chargers, which is the most that they have ever scored in a fourth quarter. Ready for this, Dan? Since 1991, in 30 years, 1991 against the Miami Dolphins was the last time that they had a fourth quarter like that. And again, as you mentioned it, from from the defense lacking, from the missed tackles, which the Chargers had 18 missed tackles in this game alone oh. leading up to this game. They had only right. had 26 through the first four weeks. You had 18 in this game alone. In spite of the turnover that Austin Eckler had, in spite of your defense not being able to stop a nosebleed, in spite of all that, in spite of Tristan Vizcaino missing not one but two PATs, in spite of all that, somehow, some way, this Chargers team, everybody was wondering at the end of the, at the beginning of the year, where's the rocket arm from Justin Herbert that we saw in 2020? I I firmly believe that at some point in the third quarter, Brandon Staley had like the DEFCON three button and just hit fuck it and said, We're going long. Mike Williams is obviously wearing a cloak of invisibility. He must have got that off of Harry Potter because there was nobody around him, especially on that second touchdown drive. There was nobody within 50 feet of him. He went, he went, from, a ca- he went from a catch, and then the next one was an incomplete pass. He was injured. And then the next one, he's open for it was three like, plays later, and then no he's open. within 20 yards. <laughs> it was insane it's like how did you forget to cover this guy i mean i know everybody's focus is on keenan allen but how did you forget to cover this guy i mean he's burned you once and then you let him do it the second time in an even worse former fashion but the chargers are going blow for blow it was perfect that this just came off of the tyson fury deontay wilder fight the night before because that's what this felt like in the fourth quarter especially it was just back and forth back and forth and you finally were starting to realize, like, dude, whoever gets this final score is really going to end up winning this game. It's miraculous that the Chargers are even in this position to say this. And you really felt like it when they get the touchdown to take the lead, or, or to, excuse me, to, to go up and tie it. All this guy has to do is just kick the field goal. Nope. And you think, oh, my God, here we go again. Snatching defeat from the jaws of victory yet again. Here we go. Chargers are going to Charger. Same old thing. This is how they lose these type of games. And I got to say, Dan, there is always a little bit of luck that comes into NFL games. And this is true for any player, for any team in history. Yes, even the great Tom Brady, a lot with Mr. Patrick Mahomes when you see the type of throws that he makes questionable fuck it not questionable all right controversial pi call on mike williams i know some people are trying to say bring it a few frames before that looks like the defender's dragging mike williams then he's dragging him it was a bad call it really was and it's just another example of how horrible the officiating has been in the nfl these couple weeks but this is the thing that really confused me is that now Vizcaino has missed the extra point. So the Browns have it. The Browns have the ability now to just ice this game by just putting the foot on the throat, get a couple first downs here, and game is over. You don't have to score points. You don't have to get in position to score a field goal. And the first play that they do is it is a run up the middle, two yards. I can't fault them for for going away from the run – 
thinking about maybe going with the run game or still going with it because it was working. It was working. You had over 200 yards rushing from this team. So, of course, you think you're going to be able to get it, and on top of that, you're going to grind some clock. Second play comes up. Baker drops back. He tries to hit, I believe it was Anthony Schwartz, uh, across the middle that Derwin James was covering and went to an incomplete pass. Now the clock is stopped. Now it is a third and eight. And the Browns run a draw up the middle. And I think they got, what, two or three yards on top of that? And they got nothing. They got nothing. And now they're forced to punt and give the ball back to Justin Herbert. You know what's crazy? The, what, you, know what's crazy you know what's crazy about that part, Jake, is if that was Brandon Staley, flip rolls. If that was Brandon Staley, and for whatever reason, Lombardi calls a third and eight draw, knowing that you're giving the ball back to Justin freaking Herbert, he's probably going for it. The way that that game was going, yes. And the, the great example, when you look at the quarterback who you're facing and the way that that fourth quarter had been going, yeah, you have to believe he's going to go down and score. I think, it, I think it's the same mentality, and we'll get into it in a couple of minutes, as far as why Brandon Staley was going for it on fourth down in certain situations for this game. But nevertheless, you give the ball back to the Chargers, and the Chargers do exactly that. And so at this point, you know, they're putting up the little red field goal line because really the Chargers at this point only need a field goal to win. But everybody in that stadium is saying, if you give Tristan Vizcaino one more opportunity to go up and kick a field goal, you're going to kill people naturally just by fainting. Something like that is going to happen. We can't handle it. We cannot handle it. So what do you do? And Dan, it looked as if it was the exact play on the fourth down plays with Jared Cook that he threw that he ran against the Raiders for those conversions it was the same damn thing it was it was a short left release right in the flat again everybody went with Mike Williams and Keenan Allen to the opposite side of the field and there was nobody in front of Jared Cook and what he ran for a 30 yard gain much closer for a field goal attempt still doesn't make you feel good though so it's just like <laughs> i want the end zone give it to me now here comes Austin Eckler coming around. Very smart move to slide right before he gets into the end zone. Mm-hmm. Tried to chew clock. That was, I think, the last timeout that the Browns it had was. to spend right there. Next play, he's going up the middle, and he's like, okay, wait, I'm going to stop. I'm going to bring it back. And no, nope, I've never seen this. They literally just take Austin Eckler and say, get in here. I don't know get if you into the, the end re- zone. On the replay, I believe, I'm pretty sure I saw both of his feet in the air. Like, he tried to go down. Yeah, I was just like, come here, little man. <laughs> <laughs> just, just get in here so we could get an attempt to finally score. So, Smart on their part. If you had Austin Eckler in fantasy, like I did, you had a great day, by the way. If you had Justin Herbert on fantasy, like I did. Fantastic you had a great day. If you had Mike Williams, I don't, you know what I'm talking about. But then, then Cleveland finally gets the final opportunity that they have to score a touchdown. And credit to the Chargers defense here, bad on Baker Mayfield and some other players for not playing the edges properly because it was three straight passes and they couldn't get out of bounds. And in about a minute like, 20, I think like 15 yards and a minute went by. I was like, yeah, this in, is- like a, I think it was a minute 20 and they had only gotten 21 yards to where now you're forced into the Hail Mary scenario. Again, the Browns had no timeouts at this point. Hail Mary goes up, of course, it's incomplete and somehow, some way, the Chargers come back from this wild victory. Dan, I know I mentioned 2006 a couple minutes ago. Strangely enough, this ended up happening. The game that I can remember that went, if not exactly like this, but it was a very, very similar outcome. 2006, Chargers at Bengals. At this point in time, the Chargers were 7-2 and two against the Bengals, who were 4-5. and five. Dan, this is how the first quarter went. Cincinnati scored 21 points. The Chargers scored zero. Zero. After the first quarter, they were down 21 to zero. Second quarter, Bengals got another touchdown. Chargers were finally able to put one in the end zone. So it was 28 to seven by halftime. Third quarter, Chargers come way back and score 21 points in the third to the Bengals' 10. And then in the fourth quarter, the defense finally decided to shut them down by only surrendering three points in the third 
Chargers score another 21 in the fourth, and somehow the Chargers come back to win 49-41 in 2006. That's what this game reminded me of, but this one was just insanity to have 41 points alone from both teams in the fourth quarter. I've never seen anything like that. So, Dan, that was just a general overview, obviously, of what happened. We have a bunch to break down from a player perspective, as you mentioned at the top of the show, the good, the bad, the ugly, because there was that. We do have to delve into that. We do have to break it all down. Monumental victory, lots to talk about, but we're not the only ones that are obviously talking on the show today. Chargers Unleashed Hotline was open last night. Dan, as you said, there are a plethora of voicemails. There is basically a week's worth of voicemails that we're going to try to get through all of them sporadically throughout the show. Today, the Chargers Unleashed Hotline is being brought to you, of course, by Charger Bolt family. Dan, who is the first voicemail on the Chargers Unleashed Hotline from? The first voicemail on the Chargers Unleashed Hotline comes from Mexico. Again, you can call in any time, 323-374-5651 for your chance to be on the show, and we'll get to hear your take and react live. Let's hear what Mexico has to say after that Chargers victory against the Cleveland Browns. Hey, it's Omar from Mexico. I wanted to start by saying, let's go Chargers! Woo! I'm loving this win, but I want to give the Browns some love. Uh, they played a great game. They maybe should have won. I also wanted to ask, which do you think is more important after this season? Getting doses and pass rushing help or looking for someone that can help with the run stopping? Have a good night and both up. Oh, this is this is all on Jake. I know where you're Jake's going with this. First off, Omar, thank you for giving us a call. Yes, bolt up. Chargers win. Shout out to Mexico, man. Mexico's been calling all kinds of times. Um, Jake, what is more important to the Chargers right now? Reinforcements opposite Joy Bosa? Or interior defensive line? Well, look, I, I've said this. In the year 2021, the Chargers rush defense, brace for it, okay? Mm. You might as well get comfortable with it because it's not getting any better, all right? Now, could you make a trade deadline type of move? I don't know. We haven't seen that from Brandon Staley. We don't know if that's something that he's even entertaining at this point. Maybe just a little bit too early. But we'll see what happens when you know the week seven bye rolls around as you get closer to the trade deadline. I'm not going to completely rule it out, but I'm also not going to say it's a foregone conclusion either. But what does Brandon Staley say as far as the pass rush goes? Sacks are not everything. And you have to remind yourself, you went up against one of the best offensive lines in the NFL last year. And at one point, both of their left tackle and their right tackle were not playing. And both of them actually played pretty damn well because you didn't sack Baker Mayfield once. You got to him on one pressure that you almost actually were able to cause a turnover on that really you should have ended up coming up with that fumble because it was a great it was a great blitz. You got to him and it ended up being a fumble, but the Browns ended up recovering on that. But again, sacks are not everything in the NFL, and I get it. You want to see a bookend kind of combo the way that Cleveland has or a defensive line the way that Cleveland has because they're nasty. Their front four is ridiculous. If the Chargers defense had guys like the way that Malik McDowell was playing or Malik Jackson or Tack McKinley and being able to stop a run game at some point or get interior defensive line pressure, it would be great. If they would get that on a consistent basis, I get it. If it's me, what are you able to do right now? If that's the question right now, you just need to work on getting Kyler Fackler more opportunities. You need to be getting in Chenna Nuosu more opportunities as far as how you're going to use him. I think the way that they have actually utilized Justin Tillery over, or uh, excuse me, Jerry Tillery over the last couple of games has been actually really creative because they've been having him come in on creative stunts. They're utilizing his speed, which is his best ability that he has. And they're trying to free him up to get that interior defensive line pressure. But again, if you're not going to sack someone, you do have to realize that this wasn't against the offensive line of the Jacksonville Jaguars. This was against one of the best offensive line in the league. So if you're going to get no sacks and still win the game, at least you can say it was playing against the best. It's much like Rashawn Slater yesterday. Gave up his 
Some people will say two sacks, his first sack, whatever you want to call it. But when you're playing against Miles Garrett, I mean, he's going to get those. He's going to get those. So if you're going to give up one, I'd rather have him give up one to him than to Micah Parsons. So just for comparison standpoint, you just have to remember what type of competition you're talking about. But in short answer, just embrace it. The run defense of this Chargers team, unfortunately, is not going to be fixed in the year 2021. You have to look to 2022 to fix that. So if it's me, find more ways of getting creative with your blitz packages, people opposite Joey Bosa. You know that you can get creative with Derwin James and Drew Tranquil here and there. That's what I would be more focused on in the here and now for this defense. Now, it is fascinating to me, Jake. And we'll just get rid of the negative right now with this one. We'll end it on this part. (laughs) We gave up over, what, 500-plus yards to the Cleveland Browns yesterday? Teams that scored 40 or more points and had zero turnovers were combined, I want to say, like 420-something and O in NFL history. I think it was 461 and O was the number. And now that number has turned to one as the Chargers offense just shredded that defense. Now, well, excuse me, Chargers offense needed to to make up for the fact that our defense could not stop them. But then on the flip side, this Browns defense that was so vaunted, talking about like, you know, second and total yards allowed and third fewest passing yards. and They only gave, and give up 250 defense. yards a game. It's, a, it's up there. Jake, did you know that the Chargers had half of the cheat of the Browns' total passing yards allowed through four games in their one game? They've only allowed 1,000 yards through four games, and the Chargers had 500, basically. Look, they allowed, the, all they, allowed, they allowed third fewest passing yards, the NFL, in, with like 184. Chargers doubled it. They had almost 400. To sum it up, nobody from either team wanted to play defense yesterday. This Brown defense was fourth in scoring defense, only giving up 16 points a game, Jake. We tripled it. I say we. We know who tripled it. Yeah, we didn't do anything. All right. They did. All right, Jake, before we get into the next voicemail, how? let's just get into it. How clutch, how freaking clutch is Justin Herbert? This guy went straight up, literally, God mode, level up. Nobody could touch him. And and, and you hear a lot of people talk about, like you hear Brandon Staley talk about, like, oh, you know, you got to have that dude. You got to have that gunslinger. You have to have that trigger puller in order to win games like this. Jake, you had me watching all these Avengers movies. And Marvel, and I just saw Captain Marvel. End games coming up. Boy, I equate, I equate like Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, to like Avengers. Like there are some guys that, like, if you have them on your team, like you're gonna win. The Chargers have an Avenger in Justin Herbert. And I'm not sure which one he is. I'm not sure if he's you know the Hulk or Iron Man or like who knows. But, like, you cannot get this guy down. And what he just pulled off, I don't think I have ever seen a Chargers quarterback do it. And that's saying something, considering who the Chargers quarterbacks have had, who the Chargers quarterbacks have been throughout history. 122 passes rating, five touchdowns, almost 400 yards throwing. In context, Against that defense, backed up, is ridiculous. And he literally carried this team to victory after getting punched in the mouth time after time after time. And it was a work of art. That throw he made to Keenan Allen on the run over the shoulder for like 30 yards was absolutely ridiculous. Jake, he, he and he and Patrick Mahomes are the only quarterbacks in the Super Bowl era with 40-plus passing touchdowns and less than 50 interceptions 
in their first 20 starts. Only he and Patrick Mahomes. This guy, six game-winning drives in his 20 starts. And I thought this was perfect in comparison. The guy he went up against, Baker Mayfield, he has seven in 50. He has one less than him in 30 less games. Now owns the record for 11 times in two seasons of 300 yards or more passing. Is now being called MVP candidate by guys like Dan Orlovsky, Mike Wilbon. Jake, through five games, this guy has almost 1,600 yards passing. 67% 67% completion percentage, three game-winning drives, I believe 14 total touchdowns. The guy's averaging over 300 yards a game. 13, 13 passing touchdowns, 14 total touchdowns, yes. 14 total touchdowns, correct. There's one other stat in there, Dan. This was the fifth time in Justin Herbert's short career that he has thrown for two passing touchdowns and one rushing touchdown. You're probably asking yourself, okay, well, why is that a big deal? Well, doing that five times in 20 starts, that's the most by any quarterback in the NFL since the 1970s. <laughs> I mean, what? I mean, actually, specifically, since 1970. That is the most times by any quarterback in his first 20 games that he has thrown for two passing touchdowns and had one rushing touchdown to go with it. And he's done that five times in this 20, 20 games that he's played. Five it's games just, in five games into his second season in the NFL, he's doing this. To me, dude, he's... I, I was thinking about when you're making like the Avengers type of comparisons, you know, because of all these comebacks especially this year that he's done it three times already in fourth quarter drives to bring his team back to win you know I you could make an easy comparison there you could say Captain America because he's the underdog and you know from from his character arc from what he comes through but then you just have to look at it just like yo it's it's Thor arriving in Infinity War to just say like I'm now going to just take the hammer to you and just take over this goddamn place I just totally flipped the script on everything. So, yeah, if you were to say, hey, which one is he? I'm going to have to side with Thor. Uh, it's It just makes too much sense in that circumstance because the rocket arm is his Mjolnir, and you're not going to convince me otherwise. I don't want anyone in Chargers land to normalize what we are witnessing right now. Like what we're seeing from Justin Herbert, put Patrick Mahomes in that category too. What we're seeing from Justin Herbert has not been done before. Like literally. And it's as if the guy just doesn't care. Like Justin Herbert afterwards, post game, you see when Brandon Staley's giving the game balls, of course he gives the Storm Norton. Congratulations to him and his family. New baby girl. He gives it to Justin Herbert. And he's like, nah, eh, it's fine. No big deal. The, the guy just loves playing ball, smarter than everybody else in the field, will smile, pat you on the back the entire way, bring everybody up, and will absolutely roast you if you give him an opportunity to. This kid is taking over the NFL and this franchise and is bringing this franchise an entirely new fan base on top of the fan base they already had. Jake, I was at SoFi, and I can't tell you the last time I had felt that much of a home field advantage. And it's because of him. We could talk about Derwin James, Joey Bosa, Brand Staley. He's the guy that is going to take this team further than anyone else on this team. So... Like, you got to just accept and appreciate and be grateful for what we have. And I just think I remember, Jake, you and I were talking, I want to say it was after the Chiefs game last year. And we were both I know, all optimistic and we we're all excited. And it was like the best we've ever felt after, after a loss in like the history of Chargers fandom. And we were like, you know, I just want to temper expectations, pump the brakes, we'll see if you can do it, long sample size. 
And now, like, fast forward, and that seems like it was forever ago. Like, real talk right now. What quarterback would you take over him? Seriously. It's, let's just say it's a short list. And I'm talking of maybe two people in that list, and one of them being Justin Herbert. Like, it's that literally, short. People are saying they would rather have him than Patrick Mahomes, which the fact that that's even a I conversation. Heard, I heard Jimmy Johnson say it after the game yesterday. I heard Mike Greenberg talk about hypotheticals. If you were going to start a franchise with any quarterback, why would you do anybody else but Justin Herbert? Look, it's nuts. This is the same type of thing that people were trying to say about Patrick Mahomes when it was Patrick Mahomes' second year. Everybody was like, ah, pump the brakes. Don't do it. Don't crown him yet. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're at quite at that point because still to me, the Chargers are not the best team overall in the AFC, mm -hmm. in my opinion. It's still it's one other team. But... Justin Herbert's making it hard to not say <laughs> these type of certain things about him when it feels like he's becoming the first to do X every single week. It's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. it, it's miraculous. And, and to watch it live and for us to be able to witness this for a second year quarterback, just this is not normal. And it has everybody excited and for good reason. And, and like, the whole stadium was going ballistic. And I'm sure Chargers Twitter was going ballistic. And I'm sure Hugh Jake were going ballistic. And he was having a heart attack. And then he survived. And you're here. And you're wondering, what the hell just happened? Chargers fans, you got a good one. And let's just enjoy this ride and be there to support him. And speaking of a good one, Jake, we have another voicemail. Someone was a little excited about this Chargers victory. Let's see what the 661 area code has to say about this Chargers win over the Browns. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. What's up, Chargers on this podcast? This is Lennon, call, your boy, calling from uh, Fullerton. I just got home from that Browns game. Oh my God. If you would have told me that they would have had 200 and what, like, 40 yards combined rushing, I would have been like, oh, we took that. That hell. If you would have told me that they scored 42 points, and hey, hey, it was a good 3 1 run while it lasted. Oh my gosh. Every time we needed an answer, Big Baller, Brandon Stanley came out and was like, what's going for it? Uh, or punching it. I'm going for it on every fourth down. Holy shit. Shit. I was, and again, I'm sorry if I'm high. If you're for listening to this podcast and you guys are just trying to wake up right now, I'm sorry if this energy is too high. I was at that freaking Browns game and oh my freaking god, I can barely talk, I can barely scream. Uh, tomorrow's gonna suck for me, but I just hope this moment that makes you guys laugh and you guys have a good time because I gotta say that Browns game, that Browns Chargers game, <laughs> Chargers baby, four and one, real motherfucking deal. You guys all have a fantastic day. Boom! <laughs> Brandon, we love you! That is what I wanted to hear. Give me more of that, damn it. You know, Dan, I, the first thing I said to you this morning, when you asked me how my Monday morning was going, it's amazing how Sunday victories make Mondays that much sweeter. Mm. Nothing is mm. going to ruin your Monday. It's impossible. Nothing is going to ruin your Monday when you have a home team victory in the NFL and especially a victory the way that the Chargers fans had to deal with on Sunday. That was Landon, insane. Landon was all of us. Landon was all of us. The, did you see the odds tracker, the percentage chances that the Chargers can win and lose? I was game not throughout? watching that, but I could imagine it was, it was probably like a bad or just like a weird crypto day where it's like, hey, it's here every, you know, like five seconds. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> it, was li it was literally like my heart rate the entire time where it goes from like up to down to up to down to up and then all the way down and then back to up and then you win. And whew, that was a roller coaster of emotions. But Landon, you personified that in one voice. Well, I ever heard it. Thank you so much for calling. Uh, yeah, that was a big deal. 
wow. Brandon Staley and going for it. Like, Jake, to go for it on your own, I think it was 24, 26, with like 11 minutes left in the third quarter. The game is literally over if you don't get this. I think you go down like 17 or to, or at least maybe even 20 if you don't get this because they're already in field goal range. And you go for it. Like, who the hell does that? And it wasn't, it wasn't, I don't even think that it was, I mean, yes, the heart was pumping when they were walking to the line to do this. I'm thinking like, holy crap, like, like he's going for it, right? I mean, this is, a, this is how aggressive he is. He knows, he knows at that point, because the defense is gassed after how they ended the first half. You had just given up the 52 yard run. So yeah, your defense was tired. To Brandon Staley, this was the game right here. And everybody on national media, I'm sure in the stadium, was going like, whoa, whoa. Like, we know you're the man when it comes to four downs, but okay, here dude, at this point, it. like, holy crap. And Dan, not only did they go for it on four down, my heart sunk when Justin Herbert went back and he gave it to Austin Eckler. I know it was a, was a fourth and two. Mm-hmm. But if you go back and you watch that film, Rashawn Slater, Matt Filer, and Donald Parham, all three of them contributed to clearing out that hole and giving Austin Eckler the room to run up the middle for the conversion. It just, Dude, at this point in time, we've been saying it for weeks now, Brandon Staley's got balls. He's got balls the size of Thanos right now. And nobody is going to take that away from him. It doesn't matter. Fourth and two, fourth and 22, he's going to find a way to get you in this. And that is the type of confidence that he has in this team. And that is the type of confidence that he has instilled in his players. And it has just, it's ran through everybody like a beautiful, you know, I don't know, as you like to say, Dan, the euphoria or, you know, just like a, uh, You know, when someone walks in the room and you're like, oh, that's like a really nice, uh, you know, ambiance smell that you got here. And everybody buys into it. And it's like the opposite of what Poison Ivy does in the comic books where everybody's (laughs) like, oh, she walks in the room and everybody's like, ooh, something's good here. Everybody's bought into it. Everybody has bought into it. It's the I don't give a shit that it's fourth down. What did he say in the all in, Dan, when we were watching that recap right before the Kansas City game? Third down isn't third down. Third down to second down. It's it's fourth and Staley. It, <laughs> it's in that's that's what it should be. It's fourth and Staley. I like that. Get that printed on a shirt. The, he talks. You hear a lot of them. He talked about you know being aggressive and, and not reckless. Like that's as close to the line of reckless as you can get without being reckless and aggressive. Dude, there's, there's a line from Speed. If people remember. This movie, Keanu, Keanu Reeves and Dustin, Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves and Dustin, uh, Dustin Hoffman, or no, excuse me, uh, Dennis Hopper. Sorry, I always get those two names confused. Uh, there's a line that recurs throughout that movie where Keanu Reeves' SWAT leader always says to him, "Crazy, not stupid." This was the this was riding the fine line for Brandon Staley between crazy, not stupid. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and shout and shout out to. Brandon Staley had a, a recent interview with, with Jim Rome, I believe. And he was talking about like what it was like to go for it then and how he does it. And he calls out, you know, everyone ahead of time beforehand. He called out everyone in terms of like the coordinators, the analytics team, the operations. And, and, and he referenced, they come up with a whole bunch of these models. They go into each game with. So that way, when it comes time to having to make the decision quickly, they just let it rip. And there's less thinking they have to do in the moment, and they just go off of it and run. And say what you will, going for it four times in the, on fourth down on the second half alone, two-point conversions, the play calling. I mean, Brandon Staley is the truth, and the, the merge of Brandon Staley and Justin Herbert is something to behold. Beautiful. And yes, Landon feels good. Feels good. All right, Jake, let's go for another voicemail from the 831 area code. Let's see what they have to say. Come on, you don't 
Shout out to Ken at Charger Bull family. In his feels, feeling great. Jake, you so think you're excited about that game? So for a second there, I couldn't <laughs> tell if it was Corey Taylor from Slipknot that was calling in and doing that. <laughs> or if like the Hulk had just called into the show. All I know is that sounded like it was right after the game, too, because I could kind of hear the background noise behind. Yeah, man. Get you some. Get hyped. That's what it's about. Love it. Oh, man. Charger Bull family. Check them out. They actually have a Justin Herbert signing coming up, by the way. Check them out. Ken, thank you for the voicemail. You are always welcome for voicemails later on. Uh, I mean, again, Landon, Ken, everyone was through the roof after this game, and for good reason. Uh, let's go to another one. 760 area code, Jake. Let's see what they got to say. Yo, up, baby? I went to San Bernardino. That game was electric fire. Short, sweet, to the point. Hey, that works. Shout out, San Bernardino. Love it. Jake, we got another one, actually, from a 760 area code, but I believe this person is from Dallas. Let's hear what Peter has to say about this Chargers victory. Hey, my name is Chase Keeter. Uh, I live out in Dallas, Texas now, from L.A. But, uh, man, what a game that was. Uh, if you didn't almost die during that game, I don't know what to say. But uh, but one of my topics I wanted to bring up is the Keenan Allen look weird this year. He is dropping more passes than I've ever seen him drop. I feel like it's a topic we're not talk talking about because I feel like he's just done so, so good for us. But I've been seeing it this year that he's dropping more passes than he used to catch. Uh, let's just see what's going on there and what you guys think about that. Uh, thanks. Bye. Love you guys. Full ganger don't bang, baby. Jake, are you worried about Keenan Allen? You know, it, Dan, it was weird because remember what I had said when we were previewing the game last week, that the game plan here from Cleveland was going to be eerily similar to how Dallas went about beating the Chargers. You know, Dak Prescott really didn't have to do anything, threw for 277, zero touchdowns. But why? Because Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard were just running over everybody. But ironically enough, coincidence, that was also a game in which Keenan Allen had very uncharacteristic drops in that game. Mm -hmm. And it felt very similar here. And I remember I was saying it myself, watching it on television. It's just, you know, you're looking at these little short routes that normally Keenan Allen could cross the field blindfolded and catch. And, you know, if you noticed, I mean, and this should be the case for any game. This shouldn't be new news to anybody. But there it should be at least one defender just draped all over him. Every single time. There, there's no way that anybody's going to let Keenan Allen roam free. I mean, Dan, last week against the Raiders in a play, I believe that he caught the ball. After he caught it, there were three Raiders that were right around him. So nobody was going to allow him to get any additional yards after the catch. So, yes, I was thinking the exact same thing because when you're thinking about these, you know, short routes that normally Keenan Allen's able to really beat people with, with his elite route running, you know, it doesn't work 100% of the time. You're not always able to win, especially when you're going up against really good defenses and good corners. But when you needed him to catch a ball, Thank you. when you really needed him to catch a ball, the hardest ball for him to catch on a third and five in the fourth quarter, Justin Herbert rolls out, puts it perfectly over Troy Hill, and awesome. Keenan Allen just extends and toe taps, toe drag swags for a beautiful conversion because, Dan, it was right after he caught it. The announcers just simply said, poetry. And that's what it is. So 
these are the type of things that you're seeing that normally if Keenan Allen has a game like that, the Chargers don't end up winning these type of games mm-hmm. if Keenan Allen drops these passes and whatnot. Historically, you take that you take the Keenan Allen effect away. Normally, yeah, you're not even in the game. But this is what this Chargers team does. When Keenan Allen has a bad game, look what Mike Williams does. You have to have somebody else there to pick up. So I Man sure- talks about it. Team of teams. Yes. So Keenan Allen, I'm sure, is going to do better next week and hopefully better the week after and the week after that and the week after that. But whenever someone has a down game, I mean, hell, Mike Williams and Keenan Allen were not even factors in the Las Vegas Raider game. It was the tight end show <laughs> for the Chargers. And to be perfectly honest, I would rather win 16 different ways than by relying strictly just on my number one wide receiver to go out and win me games. And, and two things. One, yes, I think all of us can agree. Keenan Allen has dropped a few balls that we are not used to seeing him drop. But if that is a quote-unquote bad game for a receiver, I will take that every day of the week. For Keenan Allen standards, I think he would tell you he should have had a couple more catches. I agree. I don't think that it's necessarily a trend I'm concerned about because look at his body of work. Like, that's just not who he is. He always catches it. And so I noticed it too. I was a little surprised. Even in that game, he dropped the third down one. I was right in his hands. But then right afterwards, catches a fourth down catch after a fourth down conversion. Like, come on. Like, it's Keenan Allen. Uh, Still ended up with, what, like six catches for 70 yards or something like that? Like, Keenan Allen is, he's that dude. All right, Dan, one more on the on uh, the Chargers Unleashed hotline for right now. We'll get back to the rest later. But, uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get back to some football. But give me one more caller before we get back to the game. One more caller, Jake. We have someone calling in from the 330 area code. Haven't heard from them before. Let's see what they have to say. Yes, I'm so thankful that the Chargers have the rest on their side to basically give them that entire game. Go Browns. Browns are 4-1 in my book. Chargers suck. <laughs> Okay, I got so many things to say about this. Okay. <laughs> Look, he's it's not wrong. In that alternative facts universe. He's not wrong about the Browns being four and one because if they don't, if they do not do the late game turnovers against Kansas City, they should have won that game. Which, hence, if they would have lost to the Chargers in the same form or fashion, they would be four and one. I get that. Mm-hmm. I agree with them. But you know something? All right. First off, let me just say in totality. NFL officiating, no matter what game you're watching, no matter which team you support, the NFL officiating is ridiculous. It's horrible. And yes, when it ends up deciding huge outcome of the games, that's what all the attention is drawn to at the end of the day. And that's what sucks because it really My takes Chargers the fans game. included, see Dallas. So Dan just gave an example right there. Man, you could go back years from how many times the Chargers have been on the opposite side of that fence. I stood up here, what, 20 minutes ago, saying that the the call on Mike Williams was a shit call. And it shouldn't have been that. And yes, I'll admit it, the Chargers ended up getting away with it. But that's the NFL. Tom Brady, come on, with one of the most weirdest calls I've ever heard. The tuck rule. Essentially, the the officiating and all of the rules as far as giving the offenses every advantage that exists today for all 32 teams have stemmed from Tom Brady. Horrible yep. officiating. I understand that. So I understand fully why he's pissed. Yep. But here's where I have to kind of knock back with it, is that even after that call, you still had the opportunity as a Browns team because we didn't make it any easier on ourselves because we don't have a kicker that can make a simple PAT. So we're down by one, and you have the opportunity to put a, the game on ice and put it away, despite the fact that you just had to endure a bad officiating call just a few minutes earlier. So when it comes to that, you know, this wasn't the 
this wasn't the Saints Rams game in the playoffs type of scenario at the very end of the game that just put it away at that point. It's not that same type of caliber. You still had an opportunity to put the game away and you had a lead. So whether your offense was going to go down and create a long drive and put more points on the board, or if your defense was finally going to stiffen up and allow us from not getting in the end zone, essentially your offense had a crack at it, really had two cracks at it, and your defense had one, and not any one of those could happen. So I get you on the officiating. I agree with you, Dare. The NFL officiating no. in totality. You're being, you're being way too nice. You're being no, way I'm, too nice. No, no, no I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> the N- I agree with him on the NFL officiating is crap in totality. You didn't say that. You didn't say That's that. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. You said you agree That's, with him. No, no, no. I, I, I will agree with him from the standpoint that the officiating is shit. Okay. It says the okay. officials suck, but okay. them's the breaks, dude. Them's the breaks. <laughs> it happens to everybody. And on this rare occasion, the Chargers were on the better end of it. I'm going to say your offense and your defense had an opportunity to close the game, but it didn't happen. I'm going to say the same thing I'm saying to whoever this guy is that I said to Chargers fans after the Cowboys game. Yes, were there calls that were questionable or downright wrong? Yeah. Is that the reason? Is that the sole reason we lost that game? Hell, well, if, if you're Skip Bayless, who was pointing out this bad call and then the call that he said should have been pass interference on Derwin James on that second down on that final drive or not second to final drive for Cleveland's offense when they only up ended up getting when they went the quick three and out before they gave it back to the Chargers to ultimately go on to win. He said that it was pass interference on Derwin James. So I. Unless you're Skip, unless you're Skip Bayless, apparently you do think that the Cleveland Browns. It's Brown not true. Got robbed. <laughs> but it's not true. I'm saying the same thing to this guy. As I'm telling Chargers fans, you had the opportunity, like Jake said, several times to put this game away. How many fourth downs could you have stopped the Chargers at? How many sec? How many second two point conversions could you stop this at? How many times could you have won the game if you got one more first down at the end of the game and you didn't? You have to win in spite of a lot of things in the NFL. And and a lot of times, unfortunately, officiating is one of them. So miss me with the, we lost to the refs. The refs were paid by the Chargers. Screw that. Like, we have had that happen to us so many times. Hold my beer. And yet I still sit here (laughs) and say it's not just the officiating that costs a victory or defeat. So, and... Sidebar, Jake, there were a lot of Browns fans. Arguably, I would say maybe 30% of the stadium was Browns fans. And honestly, Jake, 99% of them, class acts. I love Browns fan base. Like, they're super chill. Everyone respectful. Everyone was like, damn, game game respects game after that one. Like, that was incredible. Were Were they saying anything to you in the stands after that call? And no. up happening. Like everyone, like the thing is, everyone, Chargers fans alike, when that call happened, Browns fans were pissed. Chargers fans were like, whoo, we dodged a bullet there. Like it was acknowledged. And then you move on. Like that in the stadium, that was not why they lost. I hate when I hear people go off of stupid ass takes like that. As if they couldn't do anything else to stop to win the game. Like, you know how many times Justin Herbert could have just, like, not completed a pass? Or Keenan Allen could have not caught a fourth down catch? And the Chargers lost. But like, Cover Mike they found, Williams. They found a... Cover him! <laughs> Put someone within 20 yards of this guy! Don't come at me about officiating when your defense isn't 20 yards from a receiver! Dan, it's been a long time since you've got this heated up about anything. Oh my and God, now we're just... sitting here talking about officiating it. I can see the color of your face turning Woo! right now. Woo! All right. I'm just saying, for all of the misery Chargers fans have gone through, Jake. For, and I know Cleveland Browns have gone through quite the misery themselves. So, like, they're in a similar boat there. And it's happened to them a lot. But, like, let's have some mutual respect that, like, you got to win past that. Like you got to overcome a lot of things, win as a team. 
And anyone that comes to me with like officiating as like one call nine minutes left into the game, like stop, right. whatever. There are many opportunities. So Jake, we've gone through, we talked about Justin Herbert a bunch. There are so many guys we could talk about that had a day today. Let's just kind of fly through these real quick. Real quick. Mike Williams. Dude's looking, dude's looking like Megatron, it seems. And that's no hyperbole right now. Like, you mentioned, like, apparently Brown's defenders are playing hide-and-seek with him and are just hiding. Like, <laughs> Mike Williams literally leads the NFL in touchdowns with six. He's second in the NFL in contested catches, seventh in receptions, fifth in yards. The dude had, like, a buck 80, buck 50, I forget what it was, two touchdowns against the Browns. And both touchdowns, he was wide open. What are you doing? Mike Williams, have a day. Uh, Austin Eckler, by the way, you mentioned how good teams did if they had him on fantasy. Whew. I know one of his touchdowns was accidental, and he probably wishes he didn't score that. But man, is it good to have Austin Eckler back at 100%. Miles Garrett, I believe he had a sack. And I believe it was on Rashawn Slater, but I will not sit here and accept slander of Rashawn Slater, Jake. No, For Rashawn uh, Slater to go this many games in, five games, and give up, I'm calling it one sack, but if they want to call it two, whatever. Against the gauntlet that he has had to go through. And you watch, I think it was, I think one of the, there was someone that posted on Twitter all of the reps with him and Miles Garrett this past weekend. He looked very good. Rashawn there's Slater. One, there was Ooh. one play that easily could have been, you know, the second sack or the third sack, however you want to stat it up, that Garrett actually put a great move on Slater to where he was going to be cutting. He, he comes in outside, Slater blocks into the outside, and then he does a quick shift move to come to the inside. And it was almost eerily as similar as what Slater did last week in the Raiders games with that quick change of direction where it's like, no, 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 you're not going to get past me here. You're even cutting on the inside. I'm now going to push you back out that way. It was literally the same type of a play. So look, like I said earlier, if Rashawn Slater is giving up two sacks to Micah Parsons or, (laughs) you know, one of the pass rushers on the Jacksonville Jaguars, then yes, there's reason to be upset. But you just went up against a guy who was leading the NFL in sacks coming into this game. Literally the best in the NFL. Is the premier when it comes to pass rushers right now. So if you're going to lose to anybody, lose to that guy. And the fact that you can look, the thing is, and I think people lose track of this. The fact that you can look that good against the best edge defender in the NFL says all you need to hear about a rookie left tackle. Think about that. Rookie left tackle, hasn't played in two years, is doing this against the best that the NFL has to offer. Stop. We're good. Rashawn Slater, I arguably would still give him a game ball. Uh, Jake, you mentioned it, the trees. Chargers got themselves some dudes. And it's not just Mike Williams. It's not just Keenan Allen. It's not just Austin Eckler, Justin Jackson. Talk about the tight ends, man. Last week, we saw Jared Cook, Donald Parham go off, Steven Anderson. This week, Steven Anderson, great blocking, by the way. Donald Parham staying jiggy with it. Love it. Jared Cook, like a 30-yard catch. Like, tight ends are falling out. And we talked about it in the offseason, of what this offense could look like. With a new tight end set. They're proving us right. They're proving a lot of people right. Dan, it's... it's it, th- This is what I go back to when I was saying is like, what, what taste of poison do you want from this offense this week? You know, everybody was criticizing Joe Lombardi, and I get it, especially kind of after the first week. You know, this offense is getting ramped up a little bit. We have to remember... Justin Herbert didn't play all of the preseason. A lot of the starters didn't. And I get it just from a standpoint of, you know, wanting to gel and hit the ground running and all this type of stuff. And after that first week in Washington, yeah, you still got the victory, but you didn't, 
you didn't really see the team that you wanted to see. Mm -hmm. You didn't see Justin Herbert slinging it all over the field the way that he came out and did in his first game in Kansas City in 2020. You didn't see that. So now that I think that the rhythm has been able to get into this offense and obviously playing against players that are not the same color jersey on a week-in and week-out basis, you have now found – We remember, Dan, we said in – I think it was over a three-game stretch, we had said when Anthony Lynn was coaching this team, the Chargers are finding different ways to lose games every single week. What did we say? They're rewriting the history books on how snatching, to lose Snatching games. defeat from the Literally Jaws of victory. in the weirdest ways. If you think about the last three weeks that the Chargers have had from an – just strictly an offensive standpoint, for what you had to do against Kansas City, and even again, in that in that game, a lot of it was defense because you forced, Mah- forced Mahomes and the Chiefs into four turnovers during that game. And that has kind of, uh, un- unfortunately for them, carried on a nice little trend over the last couple Blue of weeks. Print. But print. your defense showed up. You win with turnovers. You beat them in their own house. That's hard enough to do anyways. You go right back. You come home with a very convincing win by two touchdowns over another divisional opponent in the Raiders. Not a close game like people thought. It really wasn't. And then this week that everybody thinks, okay, it's going to be one in the trenches. It's probably just going to be, you know, a a low scoring slugfest. Nobody thought that this was going to end up being a shootout. And in truth, it didn't end up being that way until midway through the third quarter. So. For this team and this coaching staff to adapt and find all these different ways to win games with different guys, as we said last week, it was the tight end show against the Raiders. I said it last week, Dan, I expected more of the Keenan Allen and Mike Williams to come back, much like they did in the Kansas City game, and and man, oh man, did they. But it's like, it's pick your poison, because Austin Eckler, through the last three games, has been awesome has been having a phenomenal three-game stretch. So you cannot forget what he's doing. And yes, it's not, you know, 120 yards rushing every time. But as far as his value from a rushing and receiving standpoint for defenses to still put a guy on him and for a coaching staff to still have confidence to run the ball and an offensive line that could create holes, I say it again. What kind of poison do you want? Mm -hmm. What kind of poison do you want? Because it's not going to work the same way every time. But what we've seen over three weeks is that it doesn't matter. You don't want us to win this way. We're going to try and win it this way. So defense didn't play well. But there is one person. There is one person. There's one person who did. And that is one Derwin James single handedly kept this game within reach. If Derwin James is not playing that game, Jake, this Chargers team gets blown out. I believe he had 17 tackles, strip sack, tackle for loss. Like, the dude was literally everywhere. And you don't like to see a safety getting 17 tackles. Like, that's a bad thing for your defense. But in this case, if he wasn't tackling, there were all going to be another 40 points scored. Like you said, you don't like to see your safety be responsible for 17 tackles. It's great for the stat box, but when your safety's having to do that much tackling, it's never a good thing. And apparently, Derwin James was the only player in the secondary that wanted to tackle. Can somebody wrap up, please? 18 missed tackles in a single game was just absolutely ridiculous and inexcusable. And this was, we're talking players around on all three levels of the defense here. Asante Samuel Jr., damn it. I he got benched. He didn't. No, he did get. He got benched for a couple of series because Trayvon Campbell he essentially got benched. Yeah. yeah. Yes. He did not have a good game. I think he had yielded like 69, 70 yards. Um, gave it, you know, one of his, for one of his statistics, he ended up giving up a touchdown on one of the plays. He did not have a good game at all. He was, uh, so I will say, I, f- I felt bad for him. There was one play where he was like, uh, it kind of reminded me of like Nazir Adderley where he gave up the, uh, McLaurin catch like 
he was right there, and he tried timing it to block to get a pass breakup, but he missed it. I remember which one you're talking up, about. Yep. On the, right, on the right hash, and I was just like, oh. Yep. And he ended up going, he played the ball, not the player. There was just way and, too much of that. And you, I know. You mentioned Nasir Adderley. Ah. I didn't, you know, talking about the missed tackles, you mentioned David Njoku. Let me spotlight David Njoku for a second. I have some stats for you as it relates to David Njoku. This oh, no. is not, and if you are a if you are a fan of this defense, you are not going to like what I have to say. Through the first four weeks of the Cleveland Browns season, David Njoku came into <laughs> this game with seven catches. Four games, seven catches, 111 yards, and one touchdown. That's through a, the first four weeks of the season. Chargers said, hold my beer, David and Joku, we're going to help you out. And Joku gets seven catches in this game alone. Goes off for 149 yards and a touchdown. Of course, a bulk of that 149 came from the missed tackle from Nasir Adderley after Denz, uh, uh, David and Joku just gave him an MMA elbow right to the face and he just dropped like a pile of bricks and then he was off to the races. So, again, totality here. Tackling was horrible. All three phases of the defense played extremely porous. You know, you have your – there's very few defensive highlights if you're going to single any player out. That's basically it. But if you were to use this as a blueprint and a growing lesson for this defense moving forward, if this is a, a game that you could say – we played our worst game defensively, and somehow we still won this game. You know that Brandon Staley is going to be keeping the defense extra hours this week after that type of performance. You weren't able to sack Baker Mayfield once. Yeah, you pressured him a little bit here and there, but it really didn't feel like it. Mm -hmm. So this defense moving forward, and if they have playoff aspirations, there is no way in hell that you are going to be able to sustain this if your defense plays like that. No. Um, you mentioned like winning in spite of, I have that as a topic for me that I think was one of the things that I took from this was, it seems like the charges are exercising demons week over week over week. And what was, what was the, the theme we heard for years? Like the chargers are losing because of coaching and are winning in spite of coaching. It's literally the opposite right now. The Chargers are winning because of coaching. And Justin Herbert. The Chargers coaching is the only reason why this team was able to win. Along with Justin Herbert. If the Chargers did not have Justin Herbert and coaching, they don't win these last three games. Period. They need both. There's no way... And so seeing seeing the demons being exercised, being able to come back fourth cap, fourth down, fourth down, being able to come back in fourth quarters, exercising demons like coming back from missed field goals and missed extra points. Like it just seems like everything else is just one more checkbox after checkbox after checkbox that like it's kind of like therapy. Is and it? I don't know. Is it? I mean, it's it's like panic inducing, but the end it, result is kind of like therapy. It feels weird, dude. It feels weird, and I said this to you earlier. I'm still not entirely used to this. I know. I, I, I know. Like, I'm confused, but at the same time, I'm like a happy confused. I don't know why I'm confused. <laughs> I'm confused about something, but I'm happy about it. Yep. It's it's really bizarre. It's like, hey, Jake. Take this book and go learn Chinese algebra in 25 minutes and tell me what you learned. Even if you could only learn one word, and I'd say, I got nothing. I got nothing because that's how confused I am. And this is the example that I made to it with the Kansas City Chief game because what have the Chargers been the brunt of for the, ver for the last 20 years, essentially, since the 2006 playoff run that they made? They have been the brunt of jokes. Chargers gonna charge her. The chokers. The they can't win the big game. The my personal favorite. Whatever can happen 
will happen, and I'm not talking about that in a good frame of mind. <laughs> this is what this team has had to listen to from both conversations among fan base and among the national media. And so when stuff like this happens, when you're like, here's a good example, Dan. I feel like I'm watching the what if Marvel version, but with the Chargers as the main focal point. Because mm. this is an alternate universe, dude. This is an alternate universe. This is not this is a variant timeline that we are living in right now with Brandon Staley at the helm and Justin Herbert doing what he's doing, because these things don't happen to the Chargers. Historically, yeah. they don't happen. Ten out of ten times, they lose these games in every which way possible, and they lose these last three weeks when you see that the way that the games have gone. So, to your point, the Chargers don't win this game without Brandon Staley and Justin Herbert. And having a coach that is finally aggressive and with balls of steel, it, it's just nuts. To, I think it's more nuts, Dan, for the fact that he has asserted this type of culture mm -hmm. for a rookie head coach just five weeks into a season. This is nuts. Feels different. Feels different. We haven't even talked about the all in episode. I feel like we got to do like part one, two, and three in this <sighs> recap. We we'll have to release this in two episodes because uh, we're going about three hours tonight. <laughs> Jake, uh, talk about an incredible game. Uh, next up on the hotline, mm. we got someone from the 925 area code. Let's see what they got to say. That was the most amazing game I've ever gone to. I've gone to a lot of church games. That was incredible. Herbert threw for over 200 yards in the fourth quarter, scoring 26 points. Unbelievable performance. MVP, MVP, MVP. Ooh. Okay, Jake. This is your topic, Dan. I know you're all over this because you actually started this conversation with me about a week early. Mm-hmm. Shout out to the 925. Thank you so much for calling in a Chargers Unleashed hotline. You're welcome to call it anytime. Especially, <laughs> especially. There we go. When you start giving the MVP chance to a one Justin Herbert. Jake, how many players realistically are in the conversation for MVP right now through five games? Realistically, yeah. I mean, you could, you could, I'd say you could make I would a say strong... three. Well, hang on a second. I'd say you can make a strong case for at least five. Hell okay. no. For a okay, tell me your three. Tell no, me your give three. Me your five. Give me your five, and I'll tell you when you're wrong. Give me your five. Here, I'll, I'll tell you this. Justin Herbert's in the five. I'll okay, give one. you that. Okay. One. Tom Brady naturally Two. is going to be there. Okay. I'll give Kyler Murray in there as well for what he's doing in Arizona. You have to give it up to Josh Allen as well. You have to give – stop it, Dan. Don't be that guy. Okay. Come on. All right. All right. All right. He's in the conversation. Okay. There's no one else. I'll, I'll put it at those four. I'll cut it off at those All four. All right. We'll, we'll split the difference. I'll stay at four. Okay. The Chargers fans, we are talking about – our quarterback in a sophomore season in the MVP discussions. And I would argue, aside from maybe Kyler Murray, not Kenneth Murray, Jake, Kyler Murray, I would argue Justin Herbert is the most valuable player to his team in the NFL. And I could almost argue he's more valuable than Kyler Murray. But like, Kyler Murray is, like, their entire offense. Like, I get it. Like, the, he's, the dude's amazing. But, like, when you watch these two play, like, it's insanity. And, like, there were murmurs of MVP chance in the stands yesterday. And we're at week five. Like, this is nuts. And, yeah, that was the craziest football game. I agree with you. The craziest football game I have ever been to. And for folks to be able to watch that live at home at SoFi and see the home crowd actually being an advantage for this Chargers team. 
was surreal. It was so nice. The euphoria of that victory was so sweet. Jake, we have an MVP candidate on this Chargers team. Period. Like, just that. Like, imagine the world. Look, this is this is what I'll give you, Dan. Prior to this game, if you just took the first four weeks, obviously, with the biggest two wins coming against div- divisional opponents in Kansas City and the Raiders, up until that point, I thought to myself, you know what? Justin Herbert's maybe not just quite getting into that group of discussion just yet. This game, obviously, has changed my opinion on it. <laughs> has elevated him to be a candidate, yes. And based off of what you hear coaches say and national media say, hell, Mike Greenberg even went out on a limb before the season even started, and he picked Justin Herbert to be his MVP of the season based off of what he did in his regular or his uh, his rookie season. But to hear Jimmy Johnson come out and say, I'm starting a franchise with Justin Herbert, and immediately after he said that, there's – the guys on his show are saying, wait a minute, over Mahomes? And he's saying, over Mahomes. I'm starting, yes, I'm picking him. And then to hear everybody say, is he the best quarterback in the AFC West right now? Now, that's not that's not academic. Some people are not fully bought on in on that. But is he, is he well, maybe the second best in the AFC 1B? in some people's eyes? Yeah. I mean, it's damn close. Like you said, Dan, you can make a very strong case for Justin Herbert right now. And this was the game that really elevated those conversations. Because like we've been saying, the Chargers don't have Justin Herbert and good coaching. They don't win this game. And they're probably realistically, based off the way that the other last few weeks have gone, they're probably more like two and three. I'm sorry. Instead of sitting at a four and one record. If the Chargers somehow can go into Baltimore and beat Lamar Jackson, and go five and one. I think Justin Herbert is firmly in the driver's seat of the MVP conversations. It's not close. You could talk about Tom Brady and what he's doing at 44. You could talk about Kyler Murray and what he's doing, his entire offense. They have not played who we have played. Period. For even the Bills, like Josh Allen looks amazing. And yes, he just had a huge statement win against the Chiefs, made it look easy. They have not played. Who we've played. For dude, like I'm just telling you, if whew, I'm gonna leave it that. I'm gonna leave it that. <laughs> Jake, so I know we've gone long on this episode. Who do you think? I'm gonna I'm gonna put you in the spot here. Who do you think is more important to this year's success? Justin Herbert. Or Brandon Staley? It's Brandon Staley. And and to me, it's not even close. It's not even close. Because everybody was talking about, oh, they shouldn't be switching coordinators. They shouldn't be switching head coaches. It's going to be a sophomore slump. When people forget, and we were reminded of that, what was it, back in, I think, April or May by our good friend, Fernando Ramirez, that everybody forgets that Justin Herbert's been with different coaching staff every year, essentially for the past four years, going back to his time at Oregon. So this is not something that's unusual to him. And he has that mindset that he can adapt and that he can grow. Brandon Staley, Dan, has instilled a confidence in Justin Herbert right now that has him playing to the level that he is playing right now. You could say that just from a standpoint of what Justin Herbert had to overcome last year from bad coaching decisions, a porous offensive line, that was remarkable within itself. You've now essentially kicked this up to the next level with Justin (laughs) Herbert because, like I said, everybody was waiting for where's the long passes that Justin was throwing last year and just, you know, bomb it down the field. Brandon Staley has now tailored the quarterback mind of Justin Herbert to say, we don't need to win like this. We can win this way, this way, this way, and this way. 
And this is how I want you to help and grow yourself as a quarterback. It's not just with Justin Herbert. Mm-hmm. It's with this offense. It's with this defense. Not so much yesterday, but they they <laughs> are playing with a confidence level and a belief that they can win these type of games. And people reference it. Peter Schrager references it. Um, and I've heard some people on uh, Get Up reference it. Whereas to dispel, as you say, Dan, the demons – of the last 20 years that has haunted this team, Brandon Staley is coming in to say no more to this crap that this franchise is known for. And whatever he's selling, like I said, if Brandon Staley was a cryptocurrency right now, it'd be selling higher than Bitcoin. That's basically what this is. He has become that valuable to this team. And it's not even close, in my opinion. It, it's it's miraculous to me because everybody talks about like, oh you know it's a it's a lot of talk like we'll see it come to fruition we'll see if he can actually back it up on Sundays like you said to do what he is doing as a rookie head coach with a whole new staff a bunch of new players like it's kind of unheard of and to be nationally recognized for that like is also kind of unheard of so. Chargers are in a good spot. And we talked about it before, Jake. Like, we said, Chargers, if they could just go three and three. Oh, I'll be so excited. I said four and two by the time that the bye rolled around would have been the optimistic play. Like, best case scenario for me. And by default, they may end there. up there. And we could even end up one game better, which is just nuts, depending on the outcome of next week. You know what I think is the biggest takeaway I have from this Brand Staley led team? And yes, it does help that we have Justin Herbert, Jake. You and I talked about this a little offline. Weirdly enough, I know this is going to sound weird, but this Chargers team is starting to look like the same type of team that a Bill Belichick led New England Patriots team had. Or a Kansas City Chiefs team has. Or now even a Tampa Bay Bucks team has. Where they can win a multitude of different ways. And instead of the Chargers having to come up with like a game plan and having to win a certain way, having to play a certain way to win, the Chargers have become, become this like amoeba. And week over week over week, change game plans make adjustments, who would have thunk, and literally can look like a completely different team week over week and find a way to win in five different ways. And they don't win with luck, although every team gets a little bit. Like They are actually going out and taking these victories. They're not letting mistakes, not letting a lot of these things that have haunted us in the past be the reason they lose. It's just one more thing to hurdle over. And so I remember us going against New England Patriots back in the heyday. And they just waited. They were just like a freaking snake. Just waited for you to make a mistake. Game's over. Chiefs, same way. Like, you had to play a perfect freaking game to be able to play them. The Browns literally played almost a perfect game. Statistically, they played a perfect game. They out possessed us by like 12 minutes. And they still lost. Like, this is, like you said, this feels weird. I'm not sure what to do. But like, Brandon Staley has his entire fan base, has the team, has ownership, has everybody having hope. And I know that's a very cheesy, optimistic way to kind of end this episode, Jake, but. For someone like you, Jake Hefner, who has been bit in the ass over and over and over, along with all of the other Chargers fans, and for as pessimistic as folks can be, damn it, you gotta at least admit that you have more hope today than you ever have had as a Chargers fan. And remember that 
the next time the Chargers are facing adversity. Just try to remember what just happened or what happened the week prior or the week prior. And remember, this is different. This is a new era, new quarterback, new coaching staff. And you have to be able to handle adversity. And like when stuff goes wrong, you could just fold up. You could just like go home and say, you know what? Screw it. We'll try next week. And if the Chargers did that, we'd all be sitting here pissed off. So, Jake, we got a little bit of hope. And as a fan covering this team, it's so beautiful. Like you said, poetic. It's poetic. It's poetry. I feel like Keenan Allen's going to put some bars. I can't sing like him. Can't play the piano. But that's, just, that's what this feels like. It's like all these things are coming together. And at some point, at some point, all this magic, like a fourth down conversion is not going to work at some point. And I guarantee you, Jake, I guarantee you, all of the pessimistic Chargers tourists are going to be like, I knew it. We shouldn't have gone for it. That was going to bite us in the ass. As if it didn't just win us three games in a row. If it can win me three games in a row and lose me one, I will take that every single time. So, in short, have hope. Enjoy the process. New era of Chargers football. And, man, I cannot wait until the next Chargers game at home, Jake. Because we're about to see SoFi a whole new level up. And it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Jake, have I, have I made a believer out of you yet? Are you buying what I'm selling? You know, we need to create like a new segment for you on this show, Dan. Just call it like like Dan's final word or something like that. But we need to put in some like musical ambiance behind you. I, I, I mentioned this. Yeah, something. I you you told a story on on the show last week that I thought was just like the way that you presented it just sounded like oh now story time with Dan Wolkenstein. <laughs> and it should have been, had like you know Not like a flute going behind it or some type of musical ambiance. I felt like that's what we need to have for you on like the last five minutes of this show. It's like you know Dan's final word and Dan's gonna tell you a story. And by the time he's done, he's gonna make you feeling Better than what you were, hopefully, before when you came into viewing this show. Maybe not all the way convinced, but he's going to give you a reason why you should. So, Dan, have you made a believer out of me? I'm still in that, like, Oh, come on. Euphoria. Again, I, it's like Ricky Bobby. I don't know what to do with my hands type of thing right now. It's just, it's weird. It's new. Yes, it's exciting. But it's weird when you've had to endure so many years of getting fed the good shit only for it to then become nothing but, you know, a cheap hamburger made by a deli in the desert. <laughs> that sounds horrible. Right? Sounds nasty. You only, get, you only get that specificity if you've lived it, right? <laughs> I got stories. <laughs> Look, we, we can we can diagnose this game and this team and where we currently stand for hours. And we've gone long. And honestly, we can keep going. But I think we need to kind of close the book on talking about this game because, like the team, we have another game. Like, Lamar Jackson's coming through that door on Sunday in Baltimore. And another test. A different kind of test for this Chargers team. But the difference is now, Jake, I'm going to do some foreshadowing here. Are you going to go against the Chargers when you're picking this week? <laughs> well, hey, Dan, to my credit, by the way, I think this should be like a record for me because I've only actually picked the Chargers to lose once through the first Fair. five weeks of the season. Yep. So... For me, historically, that's pretty damn good. It is. It is. I'm not going to give right. my pick or prediction now because you know that I hate doing that. So, yep. no, I'm not going to foreshadow a damn thing. But, yeah, there's a lot to get into that we didn't get into. We didn't even get a chance to talk about some of the unfortunate injuries that ended up happening in this game. But Which we'll, we will this week. We'll save that for, obviously, previewing the Ravens game. But go ahead, Dan. End it on a note, not a story, but end it on a positive note, please. Yeah. <laughs>
not a musical note. Oh. A positive note. All right, Jake. Chargers fans, Chargers Unleashed listeners, your Chargers are 4-1 and one, and not only lead the AFC West by a full game, you can call it two if you want to use tiebreakers, but are sitting atop the AFC Conference. Thank you, tiebreakers. There we go. And are two games up on the Kansas City Chiefs. What a time to be alive and to witness this era of Chargers football. Jake Hefner. The Chargers are looking good. It is hard to find pessimism these days. Unless you want to talk about the defensive last game. But we'll talk about that later. For Jake Hefner, you can find him at Jake T. Hefner on Twitter. Myself, Dan Wolkenstein, at Chargers Homer. You can find us at LAC underscore Unleashed on Twitter. As well as on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and everywhere else you can find us. Be sure to subscribe. Thank you guys so much. Congratulations to all of you who have had to endure so much pain for this much happiness and joy. I still have not slept great because I was so hyped up from this win. And Chargers fans, you should be too because we got a great thing going. Guys, have a great rest of the afternoon slash evening or morning depending on where you are in the world and when you're listening to this. And we will talk to you next time on Chargers Unleashed. Your home. For all things Chargers positivity. Pessimism. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> we'll talk to you later. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs>